Good morning and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Got a quick double bulletin for you today. First of all, why are so many meteors hitting the Earth right now? I mean, I think all of us have noticed just how many very bright meteors that appear to have impacted have occurred just in the last three months or so. Actually, several have occurred in the last 45 days. Is this just something that the media is reporting more on lately? Or are we experiencing some sort of increase in meteor impact events? events and why would this be happening? Well, it's not just us, and it's not just the media that's taking notice of this. The American Meteor Society reports a five-fold increase in impact-related events, at least reported impacts, over the course of the last 10 years. Why might this be happening? We're going to find out in a moment. And in other news, we've all been very frustrated about what's been going on with the ISS, the Soyuz, the repeated fuel and coolant leaks, whatever's been happening with Russian equipment lately. And by the way, the Russians are still sticking to the meteoroid impact story. And of course, I abandoned that the moment there was a second almost identical incident, but the Russians seem to like sticking to their stories. And also, we have just found out that the earliest we can expect our one stranded astronaut together with his two unfortunate Russian comrades in orbit are going to be able to return to Earth is in September, six months later than anticipated. That brief report, which sounded a bit like a shotgun blast maybe in the Texas sky, was actually created by a meteor weighing about half a ton that broke apart 21 miles above the Earth on February 15, 2023, and it scattered many smaller pieces overhead, one of which you're looking at right now. It exploded with the energy of about 8 tons of TNT, a very small object as these things go. But a quick scan of the news wires will reveal that these sorts of things have been happening all the time, and not just over the course of the last couple of months, but just over the course of the last few days. For example, Fireball draws eyes to the sky as Meteor flies over Michigan Sunday night. Bright green Fireball spotted in southwestern Ontario. That probably was the same Meteor, but certainly not the Valentine's Fireball, fragments of which fell in southern Italy, including on people's balconies. And the International Meteor Organization, together with the American Meteor Society, have taken note of just how often these things have been happening. For example, February 13th at 2.59 Greenwich Mean Time, a meteor was spotted over the English Channel in France, and fragments of it did manage to reach the Earth. On February 14th at 1,859 hours, Greenwich Meantime, the Italy or Valentine's fireball, followed by the February 15th Texas fireball at 2322 hours Greenwich Mean Time. Three days, three meteorite impacts. Now, three impacts in three days do not make a trend. However, if one examines the fireball logs kept by the American Meteor Society, that is to say, confirmed meteor fireballs that were observed by at least five people and reported to the society, one begins to notice a very disturbing trend. For example, in 2014, the year after the Chelyabinsk meteor got everybody talking about the potential danger of asteroid impacts again, well, there were a grand total of 399 reported fireball events. That is to say, 399 meteors that created a noticeable enough fireball for five people to notice and report into the society. In 2022, there were 1160 three. 
And by the way, that's 200 more incidents than were reported in 2021. There's definitely a significant uptrend in the amount of reported incidents. Now, does this simply mean that there are more observers reporting into the society? Well, perhaps, but there could be another reason. Last year, during my visit to the UK, I visited the Space Guard Center, the only facility exclusively dedicated to defending the Earth from near-Earth objects in Great Britain, and I had an opportunity to speak to the director in depth about the possibility of smaller scale impacts happening in the near future, and I was rather shocked to discover how many small scale events actually occur already on our planet, each of which amounts to the equivalent of a nuclear device going off in our atmosphere. That alone presents a potential danger to air traffic but it gets worse than that. If we are currently experiencing an uptick in meteorite activity simply because an object has recently traveled through our solar system that experienced some kind of breakup, that would mean that we can expect a lot more small-scale incidents to occur in the near future. And if you're interested in what Director Tate is actually saying here, well, I'm going to give you another opportunity to check out the tour at the end of this video where I have part one and part two of this very interesting tour recorded for you guys to check out in great detail. But once again, these sorts of things do occur in our solar system. We just don't know how often. Sometimes a comet or there could be some sort of asteroid collision that can create a large number of smaller asteroids and meteors that we simply can't detect easily. Asteroids that are 140 meters in diameter or smaller usually go undetected until the last minute. Now, nothing that's hit our planet recently has been anywhere near this big, but let's have a look at just how much damage a relatively small meteor can do compared to the planet killers that people usually talk about. So we're going to use a popular asteroid impact simulator and of course we're going to have the asteroid impact in downtown Manhattan because that's just a popular place to destroy. We could have it destroy a less important place, but if we had it impact in the ocean, it would create a tsunami. So that might not be nearly as good as just having it hit in New York. An iron asteroid only about 30 meters or 100 feet in diameter, impacting at a typical speed and typical trajectory. Kaboom! The thing doesn't actually create a crater. We're only talking about an airburst here, but the airburst is truly devastating. Five megatons worth of TNT equivalent, many times more powerful than the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima, only 3.2 miles up in the atmosphere, and the consequences of the resulting fireball would be utterly cataclysmic. We're talking about over 1.7 million people killed from the fireball, 2.1 million people receiving third degree burns, many of whom would probably die later on, and 3.5 million people receiving second degree burns. Clothing would catch on fire within 6.3 miles of the impact, and trees would catch on fire within 15 miles of the impact. And it wouldn't stop there. In addition to that, a shock wave would cause many of the buildings, except for extremely solid skyscrapers to collapse in a vast area around Manhattan and the surrounding region, and then you would have the winds. The winds would be utterly horrifying. Anyone within 2.4 miles of the impact site or the airburst site would experience winds the equivalent of an F5 tornado, over a hundred thousand people would also be killed, those of whom who had not already died in the fireball, that is. And once again, this is a 30 meter wide asteroid. Absolutely tiny compared to the things that we usually track. 
But this was an iron asteroid after all, so let's try a stone asteroid next time, and maybe have it slightly bigger than the other one, although still quite small compared to the things that we usually keep track of. Let's make it between 60 and 65 meters in diameter, or about 200 feet, once again made out of stone instead of iron, which means the atmosphere is going to have a bigger impact on the object. So here we go, Cobb. Boom! What do we have this time? Well, the altitude is a bit higher, about 5.8 miles, and about 5 megatons worth of TNT again. But look at how widespread the devastation is. And the reason is, the further up the airburst is, within reason, the larger the area affected, as long as the blast is somewhere below 30,000 meters or 100,000 feet, which means we're looking at even more casualties than was estimated before. Now, by casualties, I don't mean dead. We're talking about 1.6 million dead as opposed to 1.7 million, but over 300,000 more people would be affected with second-degree burns than with the other airburst. So even with stone asteroids, we're looking at a tremendous amount of devastation over a wide area with an object that's much, much smaller than what we usually track. Yes, I know I'm saying the same thing over over and over again, but I'm trying to emphasize just how dangerous even relatively small objects can be. Let's look at what happens when it's a little bit bigger. At the upper end of the things that we try to look for, although there's over 10,000 of these objects, we estimate that we haven't found yet. About 400 feet in diameter, or about 140 meters. Coming in at a typical speed and a typical impact angle, this time off the coast of Miami Beach. Cobb. Boom! About a 12 megaton explosion that would dig an 806 foot wide crater on the sea floor. And to make matters worse, you'd be looking at a tsunami this time. We'll get to that in just a moment. The main thing that would be devastating as a result of an impact of this magnitude, this close to the shoreline, would be wind speeds, at least at first. A thousand miles per hour within several miles of the impact zone and 500 miles per hour ravaging much of Miami Beach. The casualties would be absolutely enormous and also widespread. As you can see, powerful winds would ravage much of Miami, killing hundreds of thousands of people. That is to say, before a 462-foot-tall tsunami wiped out all of Miami and much of southern Florida. So what's the point I'm trying to make here? Well, the problem is, with all of our studies regarding asteroid impacts, near-Earth objects, and things that are likely or not likely to hit us, there's a wide variety of objects that we still don't really understand and haven't detected, or we don't detect them until the last moment. And if indeed we are starting to enter a period of high-intensity bombardment on our planet, and it seems likely that these sorts of periods occur on a regular basis, that could change everything. So what do we do about it? Well, if we're entering a period where these sorts of objects are likely to hit us a lot more frequently than they have in the past, that is to say every few years instead of every few centuries, then we would be well advised to create an early warning system far more detailed than what we have right now. Something that would at least give us a few weeks or a few months notice of an object perhaps 50 meters to 100 meters in diameter before it actually strikes, giving people in a wide region enough time to evacuate before the object impacts. This would provide extensive protection against a cataclysm that could otherwise kill millions of people who wouldn't have an opportunity to evacuate in time. 
And before we move on with the bad news from the ISS, and we've been getting nothing but bad news there, please subscribe to my channel. We've added 500 new subscribers in the last three days or so. I am so grateful for this rapid rate of growth. Welcome to my new viewers. Please subscribe. Getting so close to that 100,000 subscribers. Let's move on. So, on the ISS, it's recently been determined that two unfortunate Russian cosmonauts, Dmitry Petalin and Sergei Prokofiev, and I'm pretty sure I'm butchering those names, along with NASA astronaut Frank Rubio, are going to have to wait another six months before they can come home. That's the earliest that a rescue ship, Soyuz MS-23, is going to be dispatched. There was no indication that it was going to take this long to get our astronauts back. And when I say our astronauts, yes, I count the Russians amongst those because as far as I can tell, they've been very good and loyal partners through this whole Ukraine thing and deserve better treatment than this, but they're certainly not getting it. Now, Russian cosmonauts are accustomed to staying in space for a year or sometimes longer, and some NASA astronauts have had to deal with that as well. But the longer astronauts stay in microgravity, the more significant the impact is to their bodies, both in terms of bone degradation and muscle mass loss, and many of these problems don't go away anytime soon. But today, that didn't keep Roscosmos from blaming the first leak on the Soyuz spacecraft on an exterior impact, and they base that on photos and videos that apparently show holes on the capsule's exterior, including on the radiator and solar panels. Now, in my opinion, if it is indeed some sort of impact, it's much more likely space debris, space debris created by the Russians, by the way, not by the United States or Europe, and that's something, of course, that the Russians wouldn't want to admit either, nor would they want to admit that they're experiencing some sort of fabrication problem or manufacturing problem with their spacecraft, but by enormous coincidence, the Progress resupply ship has also experienced a leak in its radiator and cooling system in almost precisely the same location, and yet the Russians continue to stubbornly stick to the exterior problem. Same old Russians, by the way, blaming problems on exterior issues that they have no control over rather than taking any damn responsibility. And as a result, their own astronauts, together with a NASA astronaut, are going to pay the price with rigorous damage being inflicted on their bodies by staying in space for another six months. Now, chances are these men are more than happy to endure this in order to experience space for a longer period of time. Nevertheless, this is something they shouldn't have to deal with. And this is definitely on Roscosmos. And in my opinion, NASA should really start to explore the possibility of sending up a Crew Dragon along with a SpaceX spacesuit for Frank Rubio so he can return to Earth as soon as possible. It's a responsibility we owe to our astronauts regardless of the expense, and if Roscosmos won't take care of it, we need to take care of it for them. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my content, and also hit those notification bells. And until those those astronauts are safely home. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.